Death of a Naturalist is a poem by the Irish poet Seamus Heaney and it's focused on the loss of innocence and how intense passion for something can die in an instant. But of course you'd know that already if you'd watch part one of my analysis of Death of a Naturalist. This is part two and in it we're going to cover the whole of the second stanza, we're going to think about themes that could be relevant to the poem and think about the poem's meaning, its mood and the poet's motivation. But to make sure that all that makes sense to you, I recommend that you do watch that part one video. So uh, go watch that bit first and then come back here. I'll see you in a moment. <laughs> So this is where we left off in the last video with the first part of the second stanza and the five questions related to it. I hope you've had time to think about those questions and maybe to make your own annotations but in just a moment you'll see some of the ideas that I came up with in relation to those questions. Then has its usual effect in that it marks a change in time, and in this instance to a specific event that the persona wishes to explain. However, there also seems to be a change in tone. The poem seems a bit more serious now, almost as if it has discarded its youthful innocence. References to heat and grasslands are present in the first stanza, or at least the idea of it being warm and grassy does not actively contradict the setting we see in the first stanza. This is really important as it shows us that nature has not changed and that any difference that is now present in the poem is actually in the persona. Something inside them has changed. the language choices have become much more negative now, suggesting that the persona feels scared by nature, or that they are no longer comfortable within it. My analysis of the alliteration in coarse croaking is there for you to read on the slide. Heaney makes the phrase coarse croaking stand out by using alliteration in order to reflect how the sound of the frogs stood out to the persona, making them feel unsettled, nervous or intimidated. The air was thick with a bass chorus is a lovely image and continues with the idea of sounds being intimidating or unsettling. The bass chorus, which is the frogs croaking once again, has made the air thick or impenetrable and inaccessible to the persona. The persona is now alienated by the very thing they found comfort in, and instead they are intimidated. Here is our penultimate group of lines, and I hope that the change in mood is really clear to you now. There are only one, two, three questions that I'll be considering in a moment, so why not pause the video and make your own notes first. The frogs have gross bellies, their necks are loose, and they make obscene noises. Their heads are blunt as well. All of this negative language suggests that the very thing that the persona was fascinated by is now the thing that they are disgusted by. I'm arguing that the images, frogs were cocked, pulsed like sails and poised like mud grenades are unified by a semantic field of war. You cock a gun before shooting it and grenades are obviously weapons. 
pulsed like sails could make you think of old warships too. This adds to the confrontational tone of the second half of this poem, as the child and frogs are now apparently enemies. Certainly, the persona feels immensely threatened by the frogs. The slap and plop are compared to threats. This adds to the idea of the sounds of nature, such as the coarse croaking from a few lines earlier, are the things that unsettle or scare the persona. It is the sounds of nature that seem unusual and threatening and strange. And here we have the poem's final lines. We're almost there, so make sure you take a break from revising once you finish watching this video. There are only three questions this time, and I think they're quite kind ones. So here they are. Pause the video if you want to answer them yourself first. OK, so triadic structure is also known as tricolon or the rule of threes. It all means the same thing. And I'm sure you've encountered at least one of these techniques in your study of English so far. So the effect of the triadic structure is that the quick succession of verbs highlights the persona's reaction, which is one of terror or horror. They are scared. Additionally, this sentence is short and lacks description, which makes it contrast with the rest of the poem, which is long and descriptive. This could suggest that the persona now has no interest in what nature looks like. They just want to get out of there. By personifying the frogs as kings, Heaney suggests that the frogs, and by extension nature, have power over the persona. The last line is something of a nightmare or a terrible Netflix original horror movie. By ending the poem with it, Heaney is suggesting that the change undergone by the persona from loving to fearing nature is permanent and that they will never love nature again. And that is the whole poem analysed in depth. Now we are going to consider the three M's of the poem and if that means nothing to you I recommend that you have a quick look at the second video in this series which is part two of my analysis of Armitage's The Manhunt, a link for which is appearing in the top right corner of your screen now. Summarising this poem is easy, I think, and that's thanks to Heaney. I've put in a few different quotations in my summary, including the poem's title. What do you think about my summary of the poem's meaning? And there is my summary of the poem's mood. Remember, it's important to note if the mood changes or not, and why. So here, I think it's quite safe for us to say that fascination and passion are shown in the first stanza, and yet it moves to one of fear and terror in the second stanza. Why? Because the frogs have suddenly scared the persona. My comments on Heaney's motivation for writing this poem are purely rooted in context, so you could actually improve this by adding in quotations too. I feel that both the loss of his younger brother and the birth of his first child would have both been events that would have made him think about innocence and childhood. Here we have a theme table. And again, this is something that I have explained in my second video of this series, the second part to my analysis for Simon Armitage's The Manhunt. Simply put, 
I think you might find it useful to produce a large table that includes these themes that you can see on screen now and a row down the side for each of the 18 anthology poems. If I was filling up this grid, this is what I might have done. So I ticked power, as you could argue that this poem is about the power of nature or the powerlessness of childhood. I think this poem is pretty clearly about nature and I've ticked love. Now, I don't necessarily mean romantic love, but instead passion and interest. The persona of the poem clearly loves nature to start with. I haven't ticked war as it's not about a literal war, but you could definitely write about the war-like second stanza, which could throw up some very interesting comparisons to some of the other poems. I've ticked time as it's about a time in someone's life, their childhood, and because change can only occur over time. Place was another one that I almost ticked, but I don't feel that the place is specific enough in this poem for it to be considered a place poem. It's more generally about nature than a specific place, I feel. I've ticked man as this is a poem about a child and human emotion, and death, well, death is in the poem's title, for goodness sake. The metaphorical death, another way of saying the loss of innocence, is the whole point of the poem. But I don't really see this poem being particularly religious. So those are my thoughts about the themes that could apply to this poem. But what do you think? Let me know how you would fill out this grid in the comments section down below. Okay, so for this poem's revision task, I thought it would be useful to do a bit more flashcard work. Knowing your quotations and being able to analyse them is so, so important for both questions on the anthology part of your paper. You'll need at least five flashcards, although more is better. Write one of my questions on the back of a card and repeat until you've covered all five questions. Then turn the flashcards over and answer them. Write down the most appropriate quotation from the poem and also a brief justification about why you've picked it. Once you've done that, see if you can make some more flashcards of your own. Write down questions in the same style that I've done. Once you've made your flashcards, remember to use them. Test yourself, test your friends, have your family test you get those quotations stuck in your long-term memory. And that is Death of a Naturalist done. Well done, it's a long poem and we've covered a lot of content on it. Once this video has finished, I think you've earned a quick break. So get up, go outside, grab a drink, whatever. Make sure you move a little bit though, and if you can, change your setting. It makes a world of difference, honestly. I really do hope this video has helped you out and that you feel a bit more confident with this poem now. Confidence is key to exam success and simply put, effective revision is one way of feeling more confident. If this video has helped you out in any way, please do let me know by dropping it a like and remember to subscribe to my channel and turn on that notification bell as well. I'm in the process of making videos for the entire WJEC Educast Poetry Anthology and I do intend to move on to some of the other lit texts after that. Feel free to use the comments section too. You could let me know how much this video has helped you out, you could ask me a question about the poem or even add some of your own ideas and analysis which I think would be awesome to see. Doing any of those things also helps my videos reach even more people. So please do help me to help even more people. Have an awesome day. And remember to take frequent short breaks from revision.
as a burned out student is not a happy or successful student. So just how quickly can curiosity, passion and obsession die? Well it turns out all it needs is one hot day when the fields are rank with cow dung.